So one of the biggest questions I get is always along the lines of, Ian, when will we ever see quantum computers as useful? If you've watched my previous content, you'll know that quantum computers have applicability in physics, chemistry, biology, combinatorics, and hopefully artificial intelligence as well. But we've yet to see a useful calculation done by a quantum computer that's impossible for traditional digital computers to do. In this video, we're going to blow the lid that quantum computers are now outperforming other computers with useful problems, not simply in just utility, but wall time as well. The leading paper in Nature this month, this paper, says exactly that, and I'm here to tell you all about our new computing future. So let's address the elephant in the room right away. We've already seen Google announce a quantum advantage back in 2019, which was an extremely limited demonstration of the power of quantum computing. In that demo, Google was able to run a quantum built algorithm to simulate random circuits. So it's not entirely a useful workload, and simulating a quantum circuit and quantum a computer seems obvious, but they showcased it would take classical computing 10,000 years to match 200 seconds of quantum computer for that problem. Now, while Google's announcement was groundbreaking, it failed to address the utility of quantum computers, which aim to solve real-world problems. The test Google did was synthetic at best, or too abstracted from reality at its worst. Instead, today's paper in Nature addresses the boundary of quantum utility. Can a quantum computer be useful on a real-world workload that a traditional computer cannot? The paper is a collaboration between IBM, using its 127 qubit superconducting dilution refrigerator quantum computers, that we've already seen in one of our recent lab tours, and academics in California and Japan using traditional supercomputers. They were showcasing a real-world algorithm. In fact, the story is actually a bit more adversarial than the paper makes it out to be. More on that later, but let me talk about the problem they were solving first. So in any given material, particularly metals, there can be magnetism, and each atom has a magnetic alignment. Sometimes the magnetism can be permanent, such as in a permanent magnet, or it can be induced by an electric current or an electric field. When dealing in material science, one angle of calculation, along with stress, strains, thermals, and everything else, is how well these materials interact with each other magnetically. The same way a big aircraft manufacturer will simulate how other forces interact with each other on its finished product, and magnetism needs to be taken into account as well. What this paper tries to solve is something called the transverse 2D icing model. In English, this means a calculation over time on the effects of a magnetic field applied at right angles to a magnetic structure. A one-dimensional calculation for this is relatively trivial and is done on classical supercomputers today, but in two dimensions, it becomes very complex to model the behavior at the subatomic level. This means traditional computers need to apply lots of tricks and techniques and assumptions that have to be made in order to get a result out. Thankfully, a way to solve this in a quantum domain has been researched, and effectively, if there are enough qubits, a quantum computer doesn't need to make all those mathematical shortcuts or assumptions. So this is where the competition between quantum and classical comes into play. This wasn't a case of finding an existing problem and trying to best it with a classical computer. IBM actually reached out to the academics actively looking at this problem and others like it, giving them the parameters and asking them to best it. The researchers were excited for the challenge to try and push their systems to the limits using optimizations and other classical computing techniques. Ultimately, in this case, the quantum computer had won. Despite months and months of work, the classical computers could not match the results from the quantum computer, both in terms of utility and speed. To that end, what took the quantum computer five and a half minutes, the classical computer achieved a worse result in 30 hours. So what sort of hardware did IBM actually use? I mentioned earlier this 127 qubit processor, which they call the Eagle. All 127 qubits are laid out in an architecture called a heavy hex, which looks like a brick wall, as shown here. Each connection point is a qubit, and each one can quantum entangle with its nearest neighbors with the right microwave pulse. This generates what is called a two qubit gate, and it is these gates that quantum circuits for the calculation are built on. Typically, when talking about a quantum calculation, we refer to the number of qubits, or the number of gates, and also the gate depth. The gate depth is the measure of how many times a two qubit gate can be used, and this is limited by noise. And noise is a perennial problem with all quantum supercomputers. 
Due to manufacturing differences, no two qubits have the same coherence time, the amount of time it can stay up. And this is similar to how quickly DRAM cells might lose charge, and it means each qubit has to be profiled at manufacturing for how long it can stay in this coherent state. In this case, the Eagle Revision 3 chip used had coherence times between 127 microseconds and 288 microseconds. It doesn't actually sound like much, but it is really good for this type of system. And to put it into context, it only takes half a microsecond to set up and run a two qubit gate. So even with those numbers, IBM kept it conservative and ran the qubit for 60 circuits. So 127 qubits ran for 60 circuits, which we call the gate length, and we call this a 1 to 127 by 60 circuit. IBM has announced a goal of providing 100 by 100 circuits by the end of next year, and it sounds like they're getting close to that already. So I could go into the fact that these qubits and gate length enable 2880 CNOT gates, and the quantum calculation comes through stitching these gates together and so on, but I want to touch on a neat trick IBM is doing here to get a result. I said quantum computers are hideously affected by furball noise. It disturbs the result, and as such, the, this noise can cascade through calculations and the errors compound until the result is meaningless. There's a lot of work going on for error correction in quantum computers, but it still stands that you need more physical qubits to implement error correction, overall resulting in fewer logical qubits for calculations. In this instance, error correction like that wasn't possible due to that qubit overhead. So IBM turned to error mitigation, specifically zero noise extrapolation. The noise in these systems is actually quantifiable, and IBM can inject extra noise and run the problem with different amounts of noise. With enough results, the end result can be extrapolated to the equivalent zero noise result. This method has lots of applicability, and although it multiplies the time needed for calculation, we're still orders of magnitude better than conventional computing. It's going to be interesting to see how this technique works as we expand into bigger chips with more complex problems. As part of today's announcement and the front page in Nature, I got a chance to sit down with co-lead author Abhinav Kandala and KT Pizzolato, IBM's Director of Quantum Theory, about the paper and the utility of this announcement beyond the models in the paper. I'm Abhinav Kandala. Uh, I'm the manager of the Quantum Capabilities and Demonstrations team. And I'm Katie Pizzolato, and I'm the Director of Theory in Quantum Computational Science. Right, right. That, that, that's a great question. And, and really, the, the, the first part of trying to approach anything that's beyond classical is to really firmly establish confidence in your results in a verifiable regime. So with the kind of circuits that we can run, we have a very nice knob where we can change a parameter. And we're immediate. So even though the circuits are very large in, in, in volume, uh, those specific choice of parameters are very interesting verifiable points. So you can compare against those points and, and, and then build confidence in your device and the error mitigation methods. And then you move on to, re, you know, to the parameter spaces that are, that are beyond exact verification, right? So, so a large part of the work is really in, in, in verifying and building confidence that, that these machines can do something accurate. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the interesting part about this paper and something that we talked about last time and we talk about a lot internally is that getting these accurate getting these accurate values out of quantum states is what we're doing in most of our application work, algorithm application work. You're trying to get these accurate values and these load up these short depth circuits. So while this is an example using the icing model, and you know that was picked because of you know it being widely studied, it's a it's a it's a nice way to map to the system. There's a lot of other applicable things that we believe are out there that you can do by measuring accurate values out of these short depth circuits, and that's what we're doing in almost all cases, in IBM and outside of IBM, in in where we're looking at applications today. We are experts in, in, in building quantum computers and, and, and trying to figure out methods and tools to, to extract the most out of these systems. Uh, but what we're certainly not experts are on, are on the classical simulation side of things. So we really wanted to find you know, uh, a world leading group in, in classical tensor network algorithms uh, for, for the simulation of quantum circuits. And, uh, and we actually had an intern from that group uh, with us over a summer who helped us connect. 
and and they were very interested. Uh, I think initially the idea was more to to kind of benchmark and test our results, but um, it got into more interesting territory. There was a lot of you know, very interesting back and forth. We had the opportunity to to work with a very talented graduate student, Sajant, in the group. Um, and yeah, I, I think over a period of time, uh, their their methods were able to inform what experiments we had to run next. Our experiments were helping them nudge and tweak their their methods. So it was very fun. I think that we're going to continue to see this quantum classical, right? We do not believe that there's a moment in time that says, okay, we're here, quantum one, everybody pack up, right? Quantum and classical are going to continue to be partners. And I think that a part of what's exciting is what is going to happen next to, to come back and look at this problem as well. So I think there's a lot of exciting milestones ahead, and I don't think it's a, it's a one marker moment in time. Yeah. I mean, if, so if, you, if you actually speak to the graduate student um, who did a lot of the work on the classical simulation, his reaction is, well, this experiment, you know, for the first time, it, it made me think a lot more about what changes I need to make to my classical simulation algorithms. Right, so so I think it's 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 quite uh, a symbiotic relationship where uh, where what they're beginning to tweak on their end will motivate us to to change things on the experiment. Um, you know, we're very excited that our our next generations of hardware will have even further improvements um, that that should enable even larger circuit volumes, make make us you know enable us to run even harder circuits. We can be more careful about about the circuits we choose. You know, now begin to tailor them to to actually be hard uh, from a complexity theory perspective, um, and and so this back and forth will keep going. I'm also you know optimistic that once the paper is published, there'll be other groups uh, in 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 the classical simulation side of things that'll that'll really try and you know uh, see if they can verify our results, and and we really hope to to actually see if that can happen. We, we want to know if if parts of our unverifiable results were indeed correct or not. Uh, and and I, I think people will hopefully latch onto that. <laughs> I don't think there's going, I do not, well, I don't think there's going to be a time, I, quantum is not going to replace classical. I think we're all on board with that, right? Um, from a full in perspective, will there be parts that quantum, that you just go to quantum for and not classical? Potentially. Um, I think that e even in this, even in this experiment, the quantum piece still had a lot of classical pieces, you know, that, you know, even not just comparing to classical, like purely classical, but quantum still does a lot with classical to get the, the quantum result. There's a, there's a lot of other, you know, kind of co-processing that goes along there. Um, will we get to a point where that's gone and quantum only does certain things? Maybe. I mean, I can see it. I can see that you only rely on quantum for certain parts of the problem. You, you know, continue this kind of workflow where quantum is just integrated. Um, I think IBM, you know, at IBM, we believe if we do it right, there will be parts of that, that quantum should be another accelerator, another coprocessor that you use in your workflow for what you need it for. Um, when that day comes, I, I, I don't think we can put a number on that, but I, I do think this is the beginning. I mean, I, I think if I was going to say what I what I really hope this is a, a big part of the beginning of is for people to start looking at quantum as a tool. Uh, you know, the the history of of classical you know evolution was we had gains in the devices, and when we had gains in those devices, we found you know a computational you know we found something to to drive the computational side of that, and that's what I, I think. Um, this is really the start of, I hope, is that this is a tool and we need to think about how to use it and we need to think about where to integrate it and where it is going to be valuable. So many thanks to Katie and to Abhinav for coming on the channel to explaining to me what this paper really means. This paper is really information dense. Uh, it took me at least to the second line before I had to break out and try and understand what some of these terms meant. But it's an interesting read and you can check the link out in the video description if you have access to nature. Now, I'm, it's hard to explain just how important having a high profile paper in nature is to, uh, to somebody who hasn't published a research paper before. It is the cream of the crop. It's, these are the high profile journals that effectively can change where research is headed. This will get a lot of attention, not only for just what it's doing inside the paper, but for the noise it's going to produce. So congratulations to the team. And again, link in the video description. 
Now overall on this, the world of quantum computing ever since that original Google announcement has had a tricky path in the media. We are by far not even close to ubiquitous quantum computing, but it's clear that we have a path to bring these QPUs into the data center as traditional accelerators. And what's going to take time is building the software backend to use what these computers can provide. What's also going to take time is building more qubits, of course. As I've said, the paper is in nature, and do check out that link in the description. But I should point out here that IBM has also announced a $100 million partnership to build a 100,000 qubit computer in the next 10 years, effectively a quantum supercomputer. Now, supercomputers do need names. I have a few ideas, but do let me know yours in the comments down below.